So hello, my name is Wen Ting, and I am a uh, PhD student at Berkeley right now. And today I'll be presenting fast databases with fast durability and recovery through multi-core parallelism. And this was a uh, joint work done by MIT and Harvard. Okay, so in mermaid databases have become more and more popular in the recent years. Uh, they're able to achieve extremely fast transaction processing because all of the data fit inside memory. And some of the examples of these systems are uh, VoltDB and MemSQL. However, in memory databases have one potential weakness. Uh, because, because all the data reside in memory, uh, they're not as robust to crashes and power failures as traditional disk based databases. And for this project, we wanted to design a persistent system uh, for a very extremely fast uh, multi core in memory database to achieve two goals. So we want to make sure that there is small performance impact on runtime throughput and latency um, uh, based, uh, as opposed to the uh, uh, relative to the um, original uh, runtime system. And also, we want to uh, be able to recover a da big database in just a few minutes. Um, so here were some of the challenges that we faced on the way. Uh, since in-memory databases are generally much faster than disk-based databases, uh, they're able to run transactions extremely fast. So we must design our system carefully so that the persistent system has uh, little interference with the transaction running system so that the entire system can still maintain high transaction throughput. The second challenge we faced was um, designing a system so that it actually has fast recovery. From our initial experiments, uh, we just basically started out with serial recovery, and that actually took an extremely long time to recover medium-sized database. So we were looking into uh, these thousands of seconds to just recover a single database, and that was way too long. So we had to design our logging and checkpointing system so that we can facilitate fast parallel recovery. Okay, so we developed Silo R, which is a persistent system on top of very high performance in memory database um, called Silo. And we use classical techniques, so logging, checkpointing, and recovery using disks. We're not using replication here, and replication alone may not uh, be enough to solve the problem that I proposed. But perhaps more interesting is the fact that we're actually able to achieve these goals uh, by using parallelism in all parts of the system, both during runtime and recovery. Great, so the rest of the talk is structured as follows. So I will first begin with an overview of our base system, Silo. And then I will talk about Silo R's design, which uh, consists of three parts, logging, checkpointing, and recovery, followed by evaluation of our system, and finally related work and conclusion. Okay, so as I mentioned before, Silo is a very high performance in-memory database that can run millions of transactions per second, so it's highly parallel, and it has worker threads that run these transactions on a shared memory database on multiple cores. Silo uses uh, uh, optimistic concurrency control to run these transactions, or OCC for short. On this slide, I want to talk a little bit about Silo's uh, transaction ID construction and the idea of epics, uh, and this will be useful for understanding our persistent system later on. Silo transactions are run in global epic, uh, or global time periods called epics, and each uh, epic is associated with a global epic number. Um, each time period is approximately 40 milliseconds long. A single transaction belongs to a single epic, and we group these transactions, uh, many transactions, also into a single epic. Silos' writes are ordered by uh, their transaction IDs. So if a transaction T2 overrides transaction T1's writes, then T2's TID will be greater than that of T1's TID, uh, that of T1's. Um, uh, but at the same time, within uh, a single epic, we do not guarantee full serializability uh, based on uh, transaction IDs. Epics provide group commit for silo transactions. Uh, the construction of TIDs using epic numbers also help us to avoid uh, conflict on a global TID counter. And finally, epics, are, uh, epics provide a unit for recovery, so we recover entire epics at a time. For each epic, we, uh, it must be recovered entirely or not at all. So with the overview of silo in mind, let me uh, dive into our silo R design, and the first part is logging. We were faced with two choices when we um, started designing logging, so operation logging versus value logging. 
Uh, operation logging logs the actions performed by transactions, so such as increment key one's value by five, whereas value logging just logs the image of a value. Operation logging's uh, main advantage is that it writes out the smaller log, but it's harder to parallelize during recovery because operations need to be serialized. Uh, value logging, on the other hand, usually produces a larger log size, but it's very easy to parallelize during recovery. For SiloR, we decided to use value logging, um, and this is an example of recovery uh, driving uh, the runtime uh, persistent system design. And as I'll show later in the valuation section, we're able to use value logging uh, with small degradation in the runtime throughput and latency. Because of Silo's high transaction throughput, a uh, single disk was simply not enough to keep up with all the I.O. that we were um, outputting, so we used multiple disks for logging. Uh, we made a design decision to have one logger thread per disk, and since we have fewer disks than cores, we designate multiple workers to a single logger. Uh, we used this design because having worker threads do the logging themselves could potentially slow down transaction processing. And with our current design, we only um, let the worker threads do a tiny bit of work for logging, and the rest logging is handled by the special logger threads. And this is simply a visualization of what our logging structure looks like. So we have um, workers on the top, and then uh, multiple workers uh, write into uh, communicate with a single logger, and we have one logger per disk. Um, as I mentioned before, workers only do a little bit of uh, work for logging, so the workers write out log records to these buffers and then hand these buffers uh, uh, to the loggers. The loggers then group these buffers together and write out to disk. The logger threads manage log files in such a way so that log truncation can be easily performed. So once every C epics, we rename the old log file to a new file called uh, named oldData.e, where e is the largest epic seen in that particular file. And with our, uh, uh, and then we just go ahead and open a new file and continue to flush out the buffer to this new file. So with this naming scheme, it actually uh, makes log truncation very easy to form, um, as I will show later on in the slides. So as previously mentioned, epics provide serializability, and we make transactions persistent one epic at a time. So how do we actually know when a transaction is persistent? Um, so our system calculates a persistence epic, as shown on the slide, uh, so it, it's the EP on the bottom. Uh, the workers publish epic information E, and um, in the diagram shown here is uh, E1 uh, through E4. And the worker, each worker guarantees that all future log records they send to the logger will have epics greater than or equal to the published E. And after synchronization, the loggers simply use the epic information published by the workers to take the minimum of these epics, uh, minus one, to get the persistence epic EP. And this EP tells us that all transactions in epics less than or equal to EP have been made persistent to disk. And we use this information EP to tell whether a transaction is persistent. The second part of our system is checkpointing. Um, so it's actually sufficient to recover uh, correctly just from log records, but checkpointing is necessary because we would like to recover in a bounded amount of time. Similar to our logging system, our checkpointing system also runs in parallel. So we perform parallel checkpointing because, again, one disk's I.O. was simply not enough to checkpoint the entire database in a reasonable amount of time. So we have multiple checkpoint threads running. And similar to the loggers, then we have uh, each checkpoint thread writing out to a single disk. Um, and the checkpoint threads uh, share the disks with logger threads. The checkpoints happen right, uh, on a regular basis. Um, so infrequent checkpointing means that we'll do log truncation less frequently and we'll accumulate more logs this way. And then we'll, uh, that will lead to a longer recovery time. So ideally, we'd like to take the checkpoints as frequently as possible. And um, in our system right now, we start the next checkpoint uh, very soon after the previous checkpoint finish, so with only a 10 second uh, sleep in between. Checkpoint threads perform tree walks over all of the tables and write out key value pairs into the checkpoint file. Um, so we produce uh, an inconsistent checkpoint using this scheme. 
Um, we only write out committed records in our checkpoints because Silo uses optimistic concurrency control, and so only the committed records are reflected in the trees. Similar to logging, we design the checkpoint with recovery in mind. Uh, during the tree walk, each checkpoint thread writes out key value pairs to multiple files, and this allows the checkpoint recovery to easily recover using many threads. Um, than the many more threads than what was used during the actual checkpoint period. So now with um, some more details about the checkpoint. Uh, each checkpoint starts in Epic EL. In Silo R, um, as I mentioned before, we take an inconsistent checkpoint. So as we're walking over the trees, we're missing some of the updates that happen during this checkpoint period. Uh, this means that while we can truncate logs in Epic's less than EL, we can't truncate any log uh, records with Epic's greater than or equal to EL. Um, so therefore, we actually take advantage of this and we minimize the amount of data put into the checkpoint files by skip, skipping over rec uh, log records, uh, sorry, by skipping over records that were modified in epics uh, after if it's greater than or equal to EL. And by skipping these records, we're able to reduce the amount of information put into the checkpoint files. Um, and a naive scheme, checkpoint scheme that simply checkpoints all the records it counters. Uh, this means that we'll have a shorter checkpoint period. We're able to run the checkpoint more often, perform log truncation more often, have a smaller log, and faster recovery. A checkpoint ends in Epic EH. Um, after the tree walks are done, we must wait until all of the checkpointed records are persistent. So as mentioned before, these records are committed records, but they must be considered persistent for us to recover correctly because we don't perform undo during log recovery. Therefore, we perform this wait until um, EH is less than or equal to EP. After this wait, we um, perform uh, cleanup and log truncation. So log truncation simply removes uh, all log files with EPIC uh, less than EL. And this is safe because all the changes in EPICs uh, less than EL will already be reflected in the checkpoint itself. Okay, so the third part of our system is recovery. Um, recovery parallelism is very easy for our system because of the way we design our logging and checkpointing schemes. Recovery happens in two parts. First one is checkpoint recovery, and the diagram shows a rough structure of our recovery um, scheme. So during the checkpoint, um, a single checkpoint thread rolled out to multiple files on the same disk. And during checkpoint recovery, we're able to use many more threads to recover these files. So we have one uh, checkpoint recovery thread recovering uh, each checkpoint file. And thread simply goes through the list of key value pairs present in the file and inserts them into the pr appropriate tree. So this is a very easy, um, easy process. Log recovery structure um, is similar to uh, the, the diagram shown on the previous slide, except we have uh, one log recovery thread in charge of a set of log files. Since we use value logging, we don't have to reorganize or reorder the log files in any way to uh, recover them in parallel. Um, these files can be, recover, uh, can be replayed in any order, and we just have to guarantee that the log record with the highest TID per key wins. Now, that being said, we actually do partially reorder the files uh, backwards using, using the epic information in the file names. So we replay the log files uh, in uh, later epics first. And this change reduces the amount of replay updates needed for a, par a particular key if that key was modified multiple times, especially in uh, different epics. Um, during log recovery, we don't recover any log record that, uh, that happened after the persistent epic EP. Uh, this is crucial for correctness because we can't guarantee that group commit has finished for those uh, epics. And any record with greater epics must be for a non-committed transaction. Okay, so now I'll present an evaluation of our system. So this is the experiment setup we have. Um, we ran uh, benchmarks on a single machine with 32 physical cores. Uh, each machine has 256 gigabytes of RAM. Um, we use four disks, three Fusion IO drives, and one RAID 5 disk array. So here are the questions that we want to answer. Uh, can Silo R keep up with a high transaction throughput from Silo? And also, does recovery take no more than a few minutes for a large database? 
So we ran, um, we ran two benchmarks. The first one is YCSVA. This is a key value benchmark uh, with 70% read and 30% write. Uh, we ran the system with 28 workers, four loggers, and four checkpoint threads. And uh, YCSV, for this particular benchmark, the database side does not grow as the benchmark runs. Okay, so this is a, a diagram of our, or this is a graph of our uh, results. So the red line shows silo R's uh, performance, which is silo with both logging and checkpointing enabled. Uh, the green line is showing is log silo, so that's only with logging enabled. And finally, the blue line is mem silo, so that's no persistence. Um, note that we're running, um, oh, and finally, the gray region uh, shows the indicator checkpoint periods. Um, so mem silo is actually running with 32 workers. Uh, because, we're dead, uh, we're, because we're dedicating four cores uh, to the persistent system for silo R and log silo. So without persistent system, we would have used all 32 cores to run, um, to run the transactions. Um, so we do suffer some throughput degradation because we're, again, we're designating some cores just for persistence. Um, but if you look at the uh, performance for uh, uh, silo R and log silo, uh, you can see that checkpointing does not actually hurt the performance that much uh, with respect to logging. And on the bottom, you can see the actual average throughput numbers. We tested recovery uh, by simulating a crash right before the second checkpoint uh, completes, so before the new checkpoint files are installed and also before uh, log truncation can be performed. This is a kind of worst case scenario for recovery because we're recovering the maximum amount of log records, uh, two checkpoint periods worth of logs. And here you can see the performance numbers that we have. So we were able to recover a 43.2 gigabyte database from a 36 gigabyte checkpoint, uh, a 64 gigabyte log, and uh, the checkpoint recovery took 33 seconds. Log recovery takes longer, and it took uh, 73 seconds, and the total amount of time was 106 seconds, so just under two minutes. The second benchmark we ran was TPCC, and TPCC is a popular OLTP benchmark. Um, it's very write-heavy. Again, we ran it with 28 workers, four loggers, and four checkpoint threads. For TPCC, the, um, the difference between TPCC and YCSB is that TPCC's database size actually grows very fast as we're running the transactions. And so the checkpoint period also grows along with the database size. So here you can see, again, we're presenting, um, the red line is silo R, green line is log silo, and the light purple line is mem silo. Um, and the gray, gray regions, again, indicate the checkpoint periods, and the periods are getting longer because the database size is also increasing. Um, here we're actually using 28 workers for mem silo because there was no significant performance gain in this case from running uh, TPCC with 32 workers. Um, on the bottom, you can see the uh, average throughput numbers, again, for these graphs. Um, and for CPC, the, uh, all three graphs are actually relatively close to each other in terms of performance. Um, yeah. So the graph for silo R is a little bit spikier than before because TPCC is, again, very write intensive, so it's writing out a lot, a lot of log records. And with checkpointing added to the system, we're actually stressing our disks a lot to their, uh, to their limits. Um, for uh, testing recovery for TPC, again, uh, similar to what we did for YCSB, except this time we simulate a crash right before the fourth checkpoint completes. Um, so it includes the log records from third checkpoint and also the fourth checkpoint. Again, this is a worst case scenario for log recovery. And um, so the numbers are on here. Um, we recovered 72.2 gigabytes of tuples. Um, we recovered this from 15.7 gigabyte of checkpoint and 180 gigabytes of logs. So again, TPC is writing out a lot of logs. And, um, and the checkpoint uh, recovery finished in 17 seconds. Log recovery was in 194 seconds. And the total, uh, was, um, total recovery took 211 seconds, which is under four minutes. So with these results in mind, let me come back to the um, 
questions we wanted to answer. So can silo keep up with high transaction throughput from silo, and does recovery take no more than a few minutes for a large database? And our answer was yes. So silo R was able to actually have fast recovery without giving up too much on the uh, runtime performance. Okay, so finally some uh, related work. Um, so there has been uh, some related work uh, done on uh, for in-memory uh, database recovery. This is only a partial list. Um, I'm going to just very quickly talk about the first two. Um, so first one, Vault DB OLTP recovery using command logging. Uh, this paper shows uh, command operation logging is faster than value logging during runtime. And they were also able to show that operation logging is parallelizable. Uh, but VoltDB is also uh, different from our system. VoltDB is a partition database, and we are a single machine sh uh, shared memory database. Um, Second one is RAM Cloud. So RAM Cloud is a distributed data uh, storage system that has just absolutely phenomenal recovery speed. Uh, it's able to recover large database in just a few seconds. Um, uh, so, but again, RAM Cloud is uh, different from our system because it's a distributed system, whereas we're a single, uh, single machine shared memory database. So we're using different techniques to try to achieve similar goals as um, RAM Cloud. Um, uh, there is uh, more related work uh, which you can uh, see uh, in our paper. So in conclusion, um, we designed and implemented a, persist a persistent system for a very fast multi-core in-memory database, and we're, we were able to show that we can achieve a small degradation in runtime performance uh, from the base system, and also recovery of a large database in a few minutes by using parallelism in all parts of our system. Um, and the takeaway here is that we discover you can design persistent system with fast recovery without giving up too much uh, runtime performance. Okay, and with that, I would like to conclude the talk, and I'll be happy to take questions. Mark Glibridge from HP Labs. So normally databases use stable storage for logging and checkpoints, which to say they can take a, a single, fa point fa yeah, single point of failure, so like mirror <laughs> things at the very least. What happens to your performance if you do that? Um, so, so uh, right, so our system, again, is a single machine system, and we're not uh, doing replication of any sort right You should be replicating right the logs and the checkpoints. Right, so that's, um, that's one thing that we would love to explore in the future, uh, to uh, how the system will perform once we add replication to the system. Yeah, so right now we are only working with uh, persistent storage. Yeah, thank you for the question. Well, I'm not sure that's persistent. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. Hi, Brad Morey, also from HP Labs. Um, so this is really cool work. Good job. Thank nice you. continuation of the, the work out of the PDOS lab. Um, you, you evaluated the rate at which you can do recovery um, and the rate at which you can do transactions with persistence. I, I did, did a little math on the, the slide. It looked like your rate per core is slightly lower for doing transactions than the, in, than the MEM silo. Um, so that's mm -hmm. one question, if you could comment on the different, it's like, I don't know. Uh -huh. I, you know so do, do you mean silo R with respect to? Yeah, so you yeah. compare your rate for silo R mm -hmm. and your rate for mem silo per core and your silo R is lower. Um, that was one question, and the second was. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I think that would make sense because Memsala we're not running any persistence, so we're, we consider the transaction to be committed as soon as you know the transaction finishes. Whereas for uh, Silo R, we do have to uh, you know flush things to disk and then uh, and you know uh, we have to calculate persistence epic, and after the epic is persistent, all transactions in those in the epics uh, smaller than or equal to the epic have been made persistent. So there is some extra work we're doing. And also, um, especially for YCSB, again, we're running mem silo with um, uh, 32 workers, whereas right. we're you know, t kind of taking out these uh, four per, per cores. Core. For per core was the number that I was asking about. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, so there is some um, extra work it's doing because the workers are uh, you know, transferring the buffers to the loggers. So it's doing a lot. A lot a little bit of extra work, but I think um, overall, I think we were able to show that we uh, had only a small degradation in runtime performance. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So the second question was around the persistence engine. 
Oh, oh, you can go first. I'll, I'll wait. You can go first. No, no, no. go continue. Okay, yeah. Okay. So um, you use three Fusion IO cards mm -hmm. and a and a hard and a RAID array, um, but you're not really reporting on the bandwidth you're getting out of those things either while you're doing the transactions mm -hmm. or during recovery. So it's difficult to predict what would happen if I had a much faster IO subsystem or, in contrast, a much slower one. Like. Can you comment on like what was the bottleneck when you were doing recovery? Was the were the recovery threads pinned? Were you mm. were the IO subsystem pinned? And how much band? If you know anecdotally how much bandwidth you're using um, out of things. I do believe we have some numbers in the paper, but uh, for our recovery system, um, so we are actually uh, we didn't want to be IO bound, and that was why we were doing uh, kind of you know multi. Uh, we were using multiple disks in the first place because if we we're using a single disk, we would certainly be IO bound right. for the for the system. And so right now we are. Uh, uh, I guess CPU bound, and we are using you know using all cores to uh, recover as fast as possible. Um, so um, I do I do believe that there is still room for room for improvement in terms of you know recovering even faster. Sure. Um, but I think we uh, also did show that you know we achieved our goals and recovery uh, or failures are you know rare, and we are I think we are able to recover in a reasonable amount of time. Sure. Thanks. So, Good job. Thank you. Final question. Uh, just one. A quick, uh, quick question. So I'm um, Yang Zhang from New, uh, New York University. Mm -hmm. So why do you prefer to do inconsistent checkpointing? I believe you can just replay the logs and uh, get a consistent checkpoint. Thank you. Um, so we want to uh, perform checkpointing, first of all, to, so that we can actually truncate the logs. Because if we re uh, recover only from logs, then that would take a very long uh, period of uh, uh, very, very long time to actually recover a database. Um, so we're doing an inconsistent checkpoint uh, instead of a consistent check checkpoint because uh, there is uh, some over memory overhead associated with uh, checkpoint, uh, checkpointing out a consistent checkpoint. So we figured this way was faster and yeah, and perform well, so. Great, let's thank our speaker. All right, thank you very much.